Well, the propaganda model is really it's a framework of analysis. It's a right. framework, and it's uh, it's the uh, main characteristic is is the model that re rests on the structure of the system, and how the structure bears on the media. So you got uh, it puts gives some weight to <clears throat> who owns the media how it gets funded, that is to say, advertising mainly, how it sources its, its work, sourcing, uh, uh, which is mainly through elite sources, and uh, flack, uh, a, a fourth element, which means neg negative feedback, which is really a fun effective Flack is a function of power and a threat that you can pose to the media. And then the fifth element in, in this model is ideology, which again flows from the underlying power structure of the system. So uh, in, in the original model, we, we, we had anti-communism as the ideological element. But in the fur we had two further editions of the our, the book, and in in those, we incorporated free market ideology as another uh, ideological element. You could also say maybe maybe the, uh, the the war on terror, the threat of terrorism, terror, and the permanent war system is a part of the either the, the United States is threatened by uh, by terrorists, and so. That, that's in, integrated into the system and can justify any degree of militarization. So in any case, the, the propaganda model is a structural model. Uh, and because it's a structural model, it's really, it really traces back to elite interests because the structural elements that affect the media are, are elements <clears throat> that... Uh, are really controlled by the powerful people in the society, the people that own the media, the people that advertise in the media, the people that can that the media goes to for sources like the White House and corporate executives, and flack, negative feedback, which um, comes from many different places, but the flack that's really worrisome to the media is flack from people that can do them harm, that is to say, powerful people. And the ideology also stems from basic power interests in society, like the, the idea that unemployment is intolerable is not part of the American ideology. That's, that's what the 99% the or the 90% would think was really, really important, but the important people don't think that it's important that that's important. That's not part of ideology. But, but the free market, powerful people really believe and want the free market. That's part of ideology. America is, America is benevolent. Uh, and uh, we, we do good in the world. This model, this framework, is an elite supportive. It describes an elite it's based an elite, elite supportive system. It's a, it, it, uh, elements of it flow from powerful people mm -hmm. and from the elite. So it's, it's really an elite model. And some theories of the media or, or discussion of the media assume that they're just uh, objective creatures trying to pursue the truth. But the, 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 the structural factors tell you that that's, it's, not that, it's not that simple at all. That, that elements of this, the power structure feed into the media, and that, that's why we consider it a, the political economy of the mass media is related to who dominates the political economy. I, uh, it's not set in stone, but it evolves according to what elite interests exist. It's like we're, we're, so if we mention the war on terror, I mean, that's a rather r relatively recent development. I mean, anti-communism was prominent at the time when the Soviet Union existed, and when we, the, the idea we were containing the Soviet Union was the basis for 
a lot of, of what the, the power elite wanted to do. They wanted to militarize. They wanted to, to make socialism the enemy. So that became a central part of, of uh, ideology. But after the Soviet Union died, uh, anti-communism could move a little to the background. Not, it's not dead, but it's, well, but free, the free market and the importance of the free market is very important to all, all property hold owners uh, so that it could, it could rise to very great prominence. Then as became, we became a, more of a war system, uh, we, then the, the threat of terror, the terrorism business became an important part of ideology. But as I say, uh, um, full employment is not part of the ideology. That, that would be part of the ideology of the, of the very large numbers who are threatened by unemployment. Well, the propaganda model is a framework, and so the, 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 the framework uh, of the propaganda model starts with who owns it, who, sources of funding. Well, this is still applicable to the Internet. Uh, the, inter the Internet is... Is, has evolved and is now dominated by some very big companies. I mean, there's Facebook, then there's Google, and uh, Twitter. These are these are big companies. They're, they've sold a lot of stock on the market. They have paid big salaries. They have big up, very big computer operation. They're big business. In fact, there's this book by McChesney called Digital Disconnect features the, the very rapid growth of concentration in the, uh, in the, the, on the Internet. Uh, in fact, I did, there was an article in the, in the Times with a couple of weeks ago on the fact that Facebook now has a news operation. They they offer news when you when you go on to Facebook, you you quickly given the option of of looking at news. So they so they're in the news business, and they they have more people looking at their news thing than the New York Times by a, a huge multiple. But they don't. Here's an interesting important thing: is that they don't have journalists. What they do is they they latch on to, to other people's journalism and they focus the, the, their customers onto these uh, other uh, sources that, that frequently do provide journalism. What they do, what the Facebook does, is they actually arrange that for the news to go to you based on what they find that you're interested in. In other words, they use one of their what, algorithms. They, they, they're very big in algorithms. They have algorithms that look at each individual of the billion plus of their customers. And that what they're trying to do is get information available that will describe your interests, that will focus on your interests, so that they can tell the advertisers that this is what Simon is interested in. And they can then feature that and they can they sell that. They have spent huge resources developing these algorithms that, that can be sold to advertisers. And they use some kind of algorithm too to tell you what kind of news is coming through that will interest you. So. Um, but they're not make they're not doing making the news. They're sort of just a, making, uh, <clears throat> helping channel you to news that that they think might be of interest to you. It's a lot different because the <clears throat> the the old the news sources that even the the non the internet news sources still produce news. They, they, they decide what's an important story and they go send journalists out and they, they may do the news. They don't, 
they, they attune it to it, what they think that the audience will be interested in, but they don't do it. They don't fine tune it with, to within the end of, to the individual basis. So it's a, and also here the important point is that the, I think is that they have journalists they, that do journalism and produce these news items that they think will attract a large audience, not specific individuals. So one theme of digital disconnect is that real journalism has taken a body blow as a result of the development of the Internet. Because the Internet, the big boys, are attracting a lot of advertising and that get away from the old news type. So traditional journalism, traditional entities magazines, newspapers, have, have been going through a crisis for now for 20 years. They're losing advertising, and they're to some extent losing read, readers, but, but the advertising is pretty critical. So there had, there's been a crisis in, in real journalism because these papers have had to cut back. If you read the look at the New York Times, uh, they're, they, they have a wine operation, they have a travel service, they're diversifying all over the place uh, and, and trying to attract the custom uh, to, to the, buying the newspaper, but it, even with providing different kinds of services too. And they're under constant, they're under pretty serious financial pressure. So anyway, the theme, one theme, of importance is that real journalism has been taking a hit, and the the boys that have been making the, making the hit are not don't are not providing journalism. They're providing uh, access to real journalism, but not journalism itself. So, so that's that's a pretty important phenomenon. If you look back at history, I think you'll find that an awful lot of newspapers all through the 19th century that didn't go through the postal service, they were uh, service they produced locally and sold by uh, newsstands and by uh, people who carried the newspaper around just as they still do today. So the, and the postal service was just a, a conduit. It wasn't. It really didn't have have any impact, except maybe to subsidize the newspapers to some. But you could argue that that's always been true, and we'll, we'll, it was true with the rise of the radio and TV. After all, the radio and TV are are government properties, and yet they've been occupied by private parties, and so you could say that that the the uh, uh, CBS is a conduit depending on government subsidy. But the government's really essentially out of it because the, the people who they have allowed to use these signals are so powerful that the government can't do a damn thing about it. I mean, it's, it's kind of formal ownership now. And the same thing is true of the Internet. It's really a formal... Uh, the government's role was pretty formal, and they've now essentially turned it over to Verizon and and these other boys. But they're they're also just conduits. The people who now are commanding figures in the internet are not Verizon and company. They're they're the the um, these big boys up top like Google and 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 Facebook. So it's it's. Uh, it's a di it's a different story. I don't think it's I don't think it's in a way that it's, there's continuity and that the government has always been underwriting uh, private media. But so that's that that's happening again. Yes, the government is is underwriting. But the ones who are competing now for power are the the the. Uh, the the channel the conduits of Verizon and company they want freedom to 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 charge non neutral prices on their service, so, but what that shows is the government has really given over ownership 
and really can control of the channel itself to these private parties. It's a pretty, it's a complex picture, but well, the local, there's a, there's a great, the great diversity in these local journals, but they, almost all of them depend on advertising. And so they have to worry about where is the, who's, who's collecting that advertising. And insofar as, as internet parties get, get, get it, uh, that's gonna, it's going to put pressure on the local media. But a lot of that local advertising is, is pretty local. But even so, that, uh, the internet, TV, TV still pulls in a lot of advertising, local t TV. Uh, I think they're all under pressure from the inter internet. I think that these we're talking about the same kind of pressures. Advertising is a really incredibly important phenomenon in communication in in the United States, and for TV and for these all internet en entities, and for local journalism too, and they all. They're, they're all struggling to attract advertising, but the, the, to get the advertising, they need an audience. So they're all struggling to, to build audiences. And how do you build audiences? Not by muckraking, not, not by <clears throat> any kind of agitation, but by <clears throat> feeding into what people want that's easy to command. Local news, uh, the, focus on graduation exercises and and uh, parties and the farmers markets that are coming in and out and so on, that kind of stuff I think it that's also cheap it's so easy to get you can these these local outfits all tell people who might be interested in communicating with the community that we're available we're open so they they're constantly getting this stuff from uh, these things and also they they're, they're constantly visiting the, the police department and the fire department to get to to get the, stay close to them that means that they're not going to be uh, engaging in much muckraking if the, the <clears throat> abuses by developers, for example, local developers. I've always been impressed here in Lower, Lower Marion. They, they have a new library that re, they built and a new school that they built. And then standing right next to it, the, the new school is the old school, which is absolutely beautiful, solid brick structure. And uh, the, the library that was replaced was was a, a beautiful building and looked like it had 50 more years to go, but the local developers, I mean, in Lower Murray, and there have been a few scandals about the developer influence in other areas, but I th I would be willing to wager that developer interest prodded the commissioners to go for the new school and the new library building. But <clears throat> these things would... These are the kind of things that you would want to be exposed, but then it would be it would be hazardous to do that. Because you get on the wrong side of people who are pretty damned important. Well, if it, one gets to the question of of what can be done to if, of a positive nature to improve the scene, the scene basically to me looks very bad in uh, in, in the media scene because. Uh, <coughs> The country has been moving to the right. The money in politics has become more important. Politically conservative forces have attained more political power. And the public, uh, the, the evidence of that the Internet has not, revolution, uh, has not revolutionized public consciousness is that the public is, is badly confused. They, they vote contrary to their own interests on a steady basis. And somebody was pointing out recently that in one state, the, the public voted on a, a, some kind of, a, a, what do you call them, not petitions, referendum. a referendum to, to, a very, the, the, to have, a, um, to raise the minimum wage. Uh, 
It was a very big majority on the referendum. But the same public voted in a governor who's hostile to the minimum wage. You got, this is across the board. You've got the people confused. They're very confused and they opt out of elections. So the system is really looking in a kind of degraded uh, fashion uh, in, t in terms of, of uh, what the, how the, it's manifested in the political arena. The public is, does not seem to know. They don't know. They're confused. And it's a function to a great extent of money in politics and money feeding into the media and into political parties so that the issues cannot be properly spelled out and, un and they cannot be understood. So if you ask, well, what can be done? Well, how do you c cope with this? It's, it's a tough proposition because uh, the, uh, the basic forces of society have been moving to the right and the power structure has been come, becoming more consolidated. The media are more concentrated than they were t 25 years ago. They're, they're more questful of advertising. They're therefore less willing to engage in controversy and so on. So what can be done? Well, the, you, you need organization from below. You need people to, you, what, you, you need better, bigger, more powerful unions. You need more organizational structures that can speak for ordinary people. And more media, you need more media too that would do this, but where do you get that media? One of the things we, in manufacturing consent, we, we mentioned the fact that in England, for, I think it was before the 1960s, there were a couple of big working class papers that were very well read and that gave the working class a framework of thinking about the issues that fit into what it was of importance to them. But then these papers died because they didn't get enough advertising and Murdoch took over. So the, the, that was a, when the Labor Party started to plunge further downhill. And the, the public needed, they needed outlets that would speak the, within a framework that enabled them to understand and to act. Well, how do you get that? Well, you need more powerful labor organizations or more powerful environmental groups. Maybe in the internet, eventually, there will come forth uh, uh, outfits that are, you know, more powerful that that, that could speak to. There, we do have blogs and we have some operations on the internet that are quite progressive but they're small and they don't get a lot of advertising so that people don't don't really know about them it's possible that 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 they will get funded by private parties or that they will have an so such an inspiring leadership that they will grow because they're attracting people on the, the but that's a long bet <clears throat> The ideally, what should happen in a democratic society, and many people have proposed this in the past, you should have the government paying money for independent media, subsidizing on a big scale, things like the British Broadcasting Corporation and its prime, it's gone downhill, and, and public tel television in the United States. I mean, these things should be increased in size by 50-fold. If we took 5% of the money from the military budget and put it into sponsoring independent media, we could have a revolutionary media. I mean, we could. it would be really big. It would be big money. And we're talking about 30, 40, 50 billion dollars. You could have a, a powerful independent media. But the trouble is, the, the, the dominant right wing doesn't like that. They've, from the time that public television in the United States came into existence, the conservatives have been trying to cut it, to constrain it, to control it, to destroy it. So they, they like the commercial media. One thing that I, I learned years ago was that <clears throat> during the Vietnam War, 
public television had more dissident reports on the Vietnam War than the commercial media. So here you had, even though it was government controlled, it still it had enough, it was able to perform under less constraint from the power structure than the commercial media. So, and the BBC is famous for years, not very too good now, but for, it's, it, for a long time it really set a global standard for relative independence. So that is a, that's a really the most promising thing. If we could only figure out how to get the political muscle to use resources for this incredibly constructive democratic service. Actually, the Republican Party has become a reactionary party. It's not conservative. It's been from the, for the last fifteen years. It's been trying to, to, to dissolve the, the the welfare state. Uh, that's not conserving. That's going to try pushing us back to the twenties or the nineteenth century. Uh, so, the dominant free market ideologues and the the people who in the, in the Republican Party that are very important are not even conservatives. Actually, the, the political spectrum has moved to such a degree that the Democrats are, are the conservatives. They're the centrists. If you look at the public uh, um, uh, uh, public knowledge polls or public interest polls. The public is always to the left of the Democratic Party. I mean, it wants to cut back the defense budget. It wants more educational expenditures and so on. So almost across the board, if you look at polls and analyze polls, it turns out that the public wants a social democratic state. And they don't want as much war and, and military expenditure. But the Democrats keep voting for those things. It's now a war party. In fact, it, it it's now looks very clear <clears throat> that the next presidential election is going to involve peop, uh, candidates who are warriors, who want to go to war. If Mrs. Clinton is, is a really a hard line and a very dangerous woman, and of course, the Republicans are are even more warlike. So here's the the general public doesn't want wants to cut back on defense and war, and here the the political parties are going to throw up almost surely candidates who are are going to be pro-war. And in fact, the, Obama has been driven. I think he's. A, He's much of a war, pretty much a warrior as is. But I think he's been his hand has been forced. I, I think, I think any Democrat coming into power would be forced by this, this, this the media and the structure of the system to. We're we're now a war system. We're we're in a permanent war economy, and the uh, very powerful elements in that. They feed through the, in the propaganda model to, to put pressure on any president to to uh, be tougher. The <clears throat> if you read, uh, so I read the New York Times and read it regularly. For years, you can the the New York Times top reporters and and editorialists have leaned to the view that the Democrats. Are too soft on on to national security. They're, they're explicitly, frequently criticized for being not tough enough on national security. So, they, 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 this is a feed in of that pressure from the, the power structure, where the the military budget and the military are incredibly powerful, and the vest, vested interests there are tremendous, and the the APAC the, the Pro-Israel pro lobby is along that line. In a complex power structure, one the, the, in, in the one individual, or even a bunch of them, are not going to make a lot of difference. Uh, but we have to say we have to talk, act as if we maybe we can make a difference. So if you're a citizen who wants 
put a citizen journalist who, who wants to push us toward peace, well, you have to do that even though you're, you're almost sure to uh, run into real trouble. You have to probably uh, be very careful about what you do. But uh, you, I, I, I don't think that it's, uh, this, such individual choices are going to move the system. You need to have large numbers of people who, who are receptive to these changes. So uh, you, I think, uh, unfortunately, it's almost a, an old Trotskyist position. People need to suffer more in, in this country. You got, you've got a lot of people suffering, but you've got a lot of very great many people who are doing pretty well. They're, they're worried, but uh, uh, they're, they're not desperate. Uh, but more and more people are becoming desperate and, and the environment, the underlying environment is one which should make for receptivity to appeals for change and criticisms of the power structure. But the trouble is that the power structure itself is so, is, is so strong and uh, if you want to advance in the media, you have to, you have to, you, you, you can't be a, a, a strong citizen activist. You should do it anyway and take your chances maybe uh, fun because I, mean, I, I do believe in the moral rule, in the categorical imperative that, you, that your behavior should not be attuned to what will be successful, but what you really believe to be right. That this, this you have to behave in, on on the assumption that, you know, on what what you would like everybody to do, so if you if that that's a classic moral rule. Uh, so if you're a journalist, you have to push ahead and and try to to to, to uh, speak the truth. You're not to, don't speak. I have always hated the phrase "speaking truth to power." You're not one to speak truth to power. They they don't need any knowledge. You want to speak truth to the weak, to the to powerless, to the people, to the victims, to uh, alert them and agitate them so that they'll put pressure on the whole structure and maybe bring it top top toppling down. <laughs> Journalism uh, is a trade. It's a trade. And that, and in in that trade, you you certainly should uh, apply moral rules. You should apply moral rules there, and uh, <clears throat> the, 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 that the rules of that trade ought to include telling the truth, but also telling the relevant truth and helping people to understand what, what is in their interest and what policies would be good for the country and for themselves. So uh, <clears throat> speaking the truth is, has those facets that should be important to a journalist. For, for when I taught economics, I never taught uh, was, be, was an advocate of socialism, but it didn't really fit in the courses that I was dealing with. I was dealing with microeconomics, how to price system and, how, and macroeconomics. I, I never, I, I never had, to, I don't recall feeling that that was a dilemma. Maybe it just, I had my blinders were, just kept me within bounds that were safe bounds. But I, of course, sometimes, you don't do these things because you know that you, 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 it would bounce. All the, you know, if, if I were to start preaching socialism in the Wharton School in a, a class, I mean, the students would be aghast and they, they would be repelled. Uh, you, you have to accommodate to a degree to what your audience can, can tolerate. In writing books, I actually... And one thing I've always done is I've never liked to apologize first. When Chomsky and I wrote on Cambodia, we, we were, he especially was under terrific attack for being an apologist for, for Pol Pot. Uh, 
And I've been in other occasions, I wrote on, on the Yugoslav wars, and I was regularly accused of being an apologist for Milosevic, which in a way I was, because I think he was really a victim. I don't think he, I don't think he was a villain. But I, uh, I never, I always felt a great pressure not to write apologetics, not to speak about Milosevic and you know apologize for saying that I think this guy was that was uh, 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 that his trial was a fraud and that that the idea that he was a, a villain uh, who deserved the trial and all the way that he was handled I thought it was pretty outrageous and I didn't I always felt the pressure you know shouldn't I spell out what are, what are his bad qualities and I always resisted that because I felt it would be kissing ass and it would be it would be really uh, an act of cowardice to say something about him or in the case of of uh, Cambodia uh, well actually we did we always quote the things we said in in the book in in our writings where we acknowledge and make it clear that we thought that the, the, the Khmer Rouge was, was doing some pretty goddamn nasty things. But of course we put it in a the context. They, uh, and if you put it in a the context, then you're going to be accused of being an apologist, you know. Well, this, this, is, this is also true when you talk about black criminals. Suppose you mention the fact that these people were uh, were brought up in an environment where they had no options and they were going to go into the drug trade and and become thieves. Uh, you could explain this in, in to a quite an extent in, in sociological environmental terms. Uh, <clears throat> well, I always I, I I always I never held back in. And getting in, I don't think I did. Maybe I did in spite of it because I'm pretty conscious that this was a problem. You're going to get smeared if you do that. You should you should just admit that these people are are criminals and it's awful, and you shouldn't tr try to put it in any kind of that in any kind of context. Or the Pol Pot. I mean, Pol Pot came into power after the United States. And Nixon had bombed Cambodia and killed hundreds of thousands of people and created what all the real scholars say created a huge amount of hatred in, in the Cambodian countryside for what Nixon and our gang was doing. So, uh, at the t uh, anyway, the, the, there were, in our book, we, we put in all this kind of stuff. And we, although acknowledging that he committed terrible crimes, we we uh, put uh, there's context there, uh, so we just don't want to say he's a criminal. And that's all there is to it. It's explicable, and a lot of it traces back to U.S. policy. But well, that's that you can't do. But anyway, I, I was always, always been conscious, and I've tried hard not to to lean over backwards, not to lean over backwards, to to denounce the, the, the villains, uh, the official villains, to, to, to get, me, get me off the hook. It's always been tough to change a, a power structure from within but, but as on the basis of individual behavior. But we get back to these moral issues that uh, you, you, you should do it. And, and you have to just draw the line on, on how far you're willing to go. You're willing to go so far that you get fired or do you just go far, far enough so that you uh, exercise a bit of influence and indicate where you stand, which may cost you? It's a, these are tough questions, tough decisions. Well, actually, sometimes it's not tough. Sometimes you really have no choice. <laughs> the, the actions to socialize, to improve, to improve the media involve either, always, uh, actions f f that involve mass organization and people have to there have to be lots of people who want to do something 
who who either do something th themselves, you know, by starting a media, mm -hmm. or or, uh, or or else affecting the political process and getting media change from above. The, all the, the that the, the plan for subsidizing the, the democratic media is a, 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 base, a very basic and important plan, but it, it, it's not a, something an individual can do. It's something an individual can s strive to do through organizing people and getting enough people assembled to be able to put pressure on the, the power structure to, to allocate, to take the 5% of the military budget and put it into into a media, independent media budget. That would be a revolutionary development. Oh. But unfortunately, it would practically take a revolution to do it because the, power, the military is, is commanding those, that 5%, they want it. And to organize people uh, in sufficient number, I mean, if, if you could get enough people to do that, what we're talking about, you, you would have a, a, a revolutionary situation. I mean, you could do a lot of things. You could re reestablish the welfare state if you, if you had enough people who were w willing to pump significant resources into a democratic media at the expense of the Defense Department. That, that, that's, that's assuming that a, 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 a new democratic polity, polity that is hard. To, uh, I'm a real pessimist right now, as you can see. I mean, it, because I'm, I'm looking at the scene all the time, and and the, the things are getting worse. Things have been getting worse. I mean, we uh, the media scene is getting worse. The political scene. They they feed back. And the economic structures, these all interact with one another. And the, the propaganda model is, is really a facet of this c complex change in, in which uh, economic power is more concentrated. I don't have much hope. I, 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 <laughs> I mean, but you, uh, we get back to the categorical imperative. I mean, it, it, there's no point in living if you don't, if you're not prepared to do something to make uh, improve things, uh, so I do. Uh, I did, um, I'm v extremely pessimistic. I think I'm. F f I think I'm fighting a losing battle, but I, uh, I, uh, I can't uh, just die. I don't want to just die. I want to, uh, and if I if I live, I have to try to move people. And do my my whatever I can do on the basis of the categorical imperative, which and one thing one thing like it's a basis of hope is I'm an imperfect forecaster. I mean, most people, everybody is probably, but it's possible that things are going to happen, that people are going to wake up on a larger scale, the system is going to come to its knees, mm -hmm. uh, the, and and uh, going to cause enough chaos and this here so that a new political order will come into existence. And I'm pessimistic about that and I do feel that if the system falls apart, our, our power position here in order to make change is not going to be great. We're not going to be the ones to be able to to decide what the changes will be. But maybe I'm wrong. I'm hoping I'm wrong.